pulled out my phone, <laughs> chat GPT, and I said, this yep. is a car I drive, my sensor is on, blah, blah, blah. How do I reset it? It's in my blood because that's what I trained as an engineer, as an 18, 19 year old person in, in college campus. Is there any other message that you think that our audience would like to hear? Good afternoon and welcome to the podcast. I'm very excited for our guest today uh, because, you know, in today's in today's world of capital markets, we hear a lot of a lot of different buzzwords. Um, you know, at, at some point it was esports and then it was electric vehicles. And I think that there's no question that in today's environment, everybody um, with an upside opportunity is talking about AI. But what makes Pavani different, and I'm excited to have her as our guest today, she's the CEO of Cognitive Health Technologies, is from all of my conversations with her, it's uh, it's always fascinating for me at least, and I think our listeners will enjoy it, to see, well, how can AI be used on a practical basis? You know, what type of companies are actually executing on the different technologies available to them? And most importantly, you know, how does it demonstrate as a, a measurable return on investment for the companies that uh, that can utilize it the right way? So with that, uh, with no further ado, I should say, Pavani, welcome to the podcast and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for inviting me, Seth, uh, and I go by Pavani. I'm just Pavani. saying that okay. because I don't want to hear my name said incorrectly and at the end of this at end of the session, I would say the right way, and you'd say, "Why didn't you correct me at the beginning?" Of no, the no, no, no. <laughs> Listen, we're 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 family here, so that's that's totally fine. I appreciate that. So why don't we jump right into it? Um, if you could, before we we uh, look backwards at the journey of how you you landed as the CEO, tell us a little bit about cognitive health technologies, what it is that you do, what's the market that you're going after, and and most importantly, I think for our users and our our audience. What is the pain point that that you are plugging up? Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity to share. You know, another another fascinating story of AI uh, set. I think so. We have we have the the chat GPT world post COVID kind of got AI into the limelight and forefront. Everybody sure. from the schools to the teachers to like you know everybody in the corporate world. Uh, even even individuals, and I've I've heard and read stories of how people can go on to chat GPT with some of their medical symptoms and kind of give uh, the the risk, take the responses to their physicians and doctors to kind of triangulate in a different way. So it's phenomenal what we have the opportunity to use in, uh, AI and chat GPT has brought that to the front center. Uh, but if you look at where we are, like as organizations, as company, post-industrial revolution, post-internet, um, uh, folks of whom I work with and whom we have, this wave of AI is almost a third or the fourth wave. You know, it may be surprising to some, uh, but if you look at how your Google is taking you from place A to place B or tells you what restaurants are on the way or what coffee shops are on the way, that's AI working in the background. The, uh, when Google and Maps launched, it kind of uh, eliminated Garmin Industries. If if anyone knows, and that's like dating. Yeah, I'm, my I'm old enough. To, I'm old enough to know what that yeah. is, and, uh, and I was very uh, excited and... to get one. But but yeah. <laughs> so exactly. So the whole industry was wiped out because of this technology, and there's a, there's already uh, so-called artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence, or you know. Uh, all kinds of uh, names out there. So this has been there for a period of time, uh, and we are excited to kind of bring that to healthcare specifically. So uh, as as you asked, my my for, as a background, um, I did engineering with specialization in architecture. That means I used to build buildings, wow. uh, not just build buildings, but I think for me the um, the big thing is the big words right now where we have design thinking. It's in my blood because that's what I trained as an engineer, as an 18, 19 year old person in, in college campus doing this day in and out for like five years. Uh, and yeah. when people talk about design thinking, we need to go to the problem first, let the whiteboard, what are we solving? And I'm thinking in my head, isn't that the way the world is? Because sure. apparently it is not. So we have a lot of books and, you know, PhDs and everything else on design thinking. But I got lucky to have been exposed to this very early on. Uh, been in the space and when the Y2K happened, again, another dated conversation, a uh, lot of architectural hey, hey, projects. Just, just to interrupt you. It's it's so funny because 
my 18 year old said to me the other day, he's like, can you believe it's going to be 2025? And immediately what, what, what comes up in my mind is that night before, you know, the, the turn of 2000, when we all thought that everything yeah. was going to shut down. <laughs> so uh, in a blink of an eye, it's 25 exactly. years, but, but go ahead. So it, it, it surprisingly, it had an, it had an uh, not so great impact on architecture and buildings at that time. A lot of buildings stayed empty, and so a lot of projects which I was working on didn't take off. And I kind of pivoted to doing and getting an MBA uh, at that time, and then uh, did my master's in uh, business management and administration, and went back to um, a large corporate construction building real estate company, uh, where I then helped uh, people bring their dreams to reality in terms of building designs, both for corporates and residences. Uh, wow. switched gears to moving from architecture to network architecture because that's that's how life happens okay. and learned about Cisco systems and Sun systems and everything else and uh, worked with a lot of different kind of companies uh, back in the day and ended up working with a company which was doing the so-called back office outsourcing uh, way back when, uh, when the whole labor arbitrage was a thing. So you're trying to take out the low-hanging mundane manual tasks and move that to low labor cost locations like India, Philippines, where you know all of those places. So my first exposure to US healthcare and the whole nuances of, you know, I should be quoted again, I guess, the insurance mafia as we call it here, right. uh, back in the day. And that's when I started working on the healthcare space. And since then, I've done a lot of work in the data, in technology, in consulting. Uh, and most recently, which is again five, six years ago, uh, the story, uh, the reason why we have cognitive or how I'm involved in cognitive is uh, working for a company which is looking at real world based uh, evidence based data to handle and do treatment patterns for oncology and diabetes. Uh, what it needed was it needed two willing parties to come to the table, which is the providers and the payers to look at the data and exchange data and what's working for my patients, uh, where you know what's working, what's not working, and how do you create reimbursement models around that so that they get paid appropriately by the payers because the providers cannot just go ahead and say, I'm going to do this and not get paid. So there were two willing parties at the table to do this, um, but they could not do it because their systems wouldn't talk to each other. There was no data flow happening between the two. You needed to throw in a lot of bodies it was always the last on the list of the priority list of the people working on the project because there were so many other things to do. So, so that's when the banking and the financial industry was already ahead of healthcare in terms of leveraging the bot technology and said, hey, can we not bring the bot technology here so we're not throwing bodies and people at this problem of data exchange and getting this to work? Why don't we use uh, the, the RPA or the bot technology back then? Um, that was the phase where I got involved into building this product uh, okay. for Cognitive. So Cognitive, uh, so since then it has evolved so much that the bot technology on its own standalone doesn't work, uh, as they call RPA is dead. Again, count me on that. I didn't. I'm, I'm okay. not quoting this. It was. It's been. It's all over. Uh, and what helps AI in the in the so-called always dynamic changing landscape of healthcare? is AI, RP standalone doesn't, cannot automate workflows. It doesn't give as much results. It has it has its own benefits, it has its own place. But if you're looking to uh, really automate and get the ROI, what you talked about Seth earlier, you need to look at the AI technology. So a Cognitive Health built the AI platform ICANN. Uh, it's integrated cognitive automation, a, autom a agent network. Okay. Uh, for us to be able to automate end-to-end -end back office administrative functions for healthcare uh, providers. Interesting. So many, you know, it, at least for myself, you know, many times when you hear about healthcare and all the companies that um, have the opportunity to contribute to to the growing industry, you know, you think of it more on the medical side. But to your credit, you are focusing on the back end, um, you know, and the administrative. So, so tell us then, like, who is the ideal customer? Uh, who are some of your clients? And and on a day to day basis, so what is what is the problem that that this ICANN technology is is really solving for? Sure, Seth. Um, so post 
post covid I, the, and I, it's it is a, there's a world pre covid and the world post covid i think sure, we need to come up with like the bc bc sure, terms right. of you know, exactly. bc and post c kind of, of thing course. the biggest uh, you know healthcare is is uh, is one of the largest employers of for in the country right there's one of the top employers of the country i think almost uh, in every state you have uh, a, you know, healthcare as one of the top employers or one of the top two at least if not the top one uh, post covid the the whole remote working and so much of pressures and everything else has put so much pressure on this uh, staffing industry that in 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 the staffing for healthcare there was a lot of pressure to get things done uh, in the right way so from both from the clinicians and the clinical side to the uh, to the back end of administrative functions so that one of the biggest thing is how do we work through this whole staffing challenge you know we're not able to hire the right t people at the right time uh, there's an aging population who's retiring and you're finding it difficult to backfill and the costs staffing costs have increased significantly without necessarily the payment terms or anything else so there are so many staffing challenges that is one of the key areas and drivers for us to look at and say, can we somehow enable the staff to do and focus on something more meaningful and productive and take away the mundane, the redundant, the clicks and the key keypads and the keyboards kind of away from uh, the staff. And again, this is my personal story. I've always, um, there's the Star Wars fan here. Okay. <laughs> And I always believe that, hey, why are there only two, three people who have so-called Jedi mindset or the Jedis? And I think each and every right. one of us is capable of doing more than what we think we do in the nine to five corporate job or whichever jobs we are doing, both physical and uh, and uh, mental. And okay. I feel like if you're able to help and aid us ourselves and take away the routine and the mundane, like I don't have to answer my emails unless it's the top three <clears> things where I have to create something. I don't have to do the Excel and move the data. I just want to type in my question and the, the system to be able to answer my question in a more meaningful and intelligent way. I don't want to spend time taking intake forms and keying from system to system. I want to spend that time in person, face to face, looking at the other person, you know, who who the person is, how do we interact with that? So right. it, it's the systems and technology should uh, enable us to live more human and take away the non-human parts of it. Uh, and that's what uh, we we hope that I can agents uh, are uh, would are doing right now and will be doing more in the healthcare space right now. Can I so can I just interrupt? The, you, can I just interrupt you for yeah, a second? Yeah. I think what you're saying is so sure. important in terms of you know us you know enabling each one of us to be able to 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 do more ourselves. Uh, I'll tell you just a thirty second example yesterday, which I was even fascinated about. So I, I had a tire issue, right? I, I don't I don't drive an old clunky car. I, I, I have a I have a, a Range Rover and I had some tire issues and and I got the tire fixed. And then and then as I was pulling away, the light sensor was still on that I had a tire issue. So I went back to the tire guy and I said, the light sensor is still on. So he said, as I was pulling away, he's like, either it'll go away in a minute or two, or read the read the handbook and the manual and reset the tire sensor. And I pulled away. So after like 20 minutes, a half hour, I, I was far enough away from the tire guy and it wasn't resetting. And then I'm thinking to myself, what does that mean? He wants me to read the entire, like I looked in the glove <laughs> compartment and the, 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 right. the manual is like 400 pages yep. and to start sitting there. So I, I promise you, here's what I did. I pulled out my phone, <laughs> chat GPT, and I said, this yep. is the car I drive. My sensor is on, blah, blah, blah. How do I reset it? And instantly, push this, touch that, do this, yeah. done. I was just like, that just saved me hours of looking at a manual. Yes. And to your point, the fact that 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 you guys are focused on not just the benefits of to the company, but just the human element of of that extra time and, and utilizing them, I think is fantastic. Um, so so what type of company then is or, or what type of is it is it a hospital? Is it a facility? Is it a nursing home? Like What's the ideal target for you? So right now, so the, the vision for co cognitive and I can is to sit between the provider and the payer space set. I think we want to be in the middle. We want to uh, enable the workflows between the provider and the payer in such a seamless manner that you probably the AI on the provider's side of the firewall would talk to the AI on the payer side of the firewall and execute the whole function. That's where our dream and our vision is. 
But right okay. now we are focused on client base where we are building and developing is mostly on the provider side. So anyone who is who's dealing with staffing challenges, so the typical uh, hospital health systems, academic medical centers, regional hospitals, physician groups, specialty providers, you know, behavioral health, dermatology, orthopedics, uh, any of these groups, um, um, nursing homes, any provider group which is struggling with staffing challenges and or wants to scale and you know expand their business with the same amount of staff uh, is an ideal customer for us. And I think that I can can help them uh, multiply their productivity of their staff, or if not if having staffing challenges, we take away the manual errors and all the pain which you get from having uh, staff to do certain tasks, which you know, you're not essentially supposed to be even letting them do like, we, we invented Excel to like take away a lot of stuff and said we created Excel experts around that. So, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah. I, I think you always try to be innovative about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you had mentioned, I forget if it was your website or one of the articles or, or some of our prior discussions, that um, that 30 33% of the healthcare centers operate at negative margins. So, so tell me, how is it that? that what you guys are trying to accomplish, how does that how does that help bring those margins to a healthier place? So, a great question. So I think one of the things we have, we have observed and recorded, if you, uh, for some of the Clark customers where we have the implementation and up and running for a period of time, is that our tool is, our, our platform is able to eliminate at, up to 80% of the manual tasks within that workflow which means that you're able to leverage your staff in a different place. You're able to not need to you know, hire back people or whoever is retired or even bring back temp staff during the seasonal high peaks, et cetera. So we have seen 80% of reduction um, in the staffing needs for a specific workflow. That is one variable and driver. The second important thing is AI does what AI does irrespective of the Sunday or having a bad day, there's a good day, you know, it doesn't right. matter. It does right. the same exact thing over and over with the, with the same predictability, if you will. So you're avoiding a lot of manual errors, uh, which is one of the another reason or cause for a lot of rework, denials and frustrations from the, from, from the front end team to the mid office, the back office, you're avoiding a lot of those reworks um, uh, and, and manual errors. And third, most important, the the, the lang large language models and you know getting a little technical here but the the data the capability for ai to read review and process such vast large amounts of data in a very short period of time uh, and draw insights which are not human driven insights but the models are learning as they as they call it those help these companies to not leave money on the table there are a lot of places where the money is left on the table because you haven't been able to handle the denial on time. You haven't had the proper uh, pro for board flows in uh, upfront for proper registration. So your eligibilities are not done. So you're you're uh, getting denied, which there's nothing you can do about. So there are a lot of workflow related uh, data related insights you're leveraging from AI, which is enabling you to not leave money on the table. So it not only helps with the bottom line for your uh, staffing costs, but also helps with your top line if used well to be able to push your top line up to. So those are the reasons why we think this can have a meaningful impact uh, on the industry right now. That's that's interesting. And and let me ask you like a, a CEO type question here. Um, and I think that a lot of the listeners um, e either have pivoted careers in their lives. You know, I certainly know that um, when when I graduated law school, I, I didn't expect to be doing stock transfer or LinkedIn or, or half the things that I've done, you know, sitting where you are right now, um, did you did you ever expect that you would make that transition from, you know, sort of real estate, uh, the real estate world to, to the AI world? Um, did you find that to be a seamless tran transition? And then I guess part two of my question is when we talk about AI, I feel like, um, you know, it changes by the minute, right? The technology. So how how do you how do you and your team keep up with everything so that everything is is current? Thanks for that question. I don't have. I don't think I ever thought of AI was even a thing. I think right. I learned how to code back in the day, as I mentioned, when architecture. When I was in my final years of architecture, doing my thesis, 
you know, all our senior folks who are in the market industry are like, oh, everything is slowing down. You guys need better do something else, like have a plan B. So I learned coding and did a bunch of cool things of how the program I created was was able to work on the lights and turn on and off the lights in the house. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, but there was just one 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 project, and then for that, but it needs to be connected to something for it to control that, you know. So the whole electric wiring had to be changed. So it was like a non-starter <laughs> for my parents' right. house. Okay. Uh, but so they, I was always fascinated by technology, and I've always uh, dipped toes and stayed in touch. But I never, and I never thought I would do something related to AI. But okay. what I always knew I would want to do is build something on my own. So I think that was something. Uh, from very uh, early age, my grandfather and I used to play um, shop. I was the doctor and he was the one who's managing my 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 whole setup. So I always wanted to be my own boss from a very early age. So I think uh, in every role, in every area, every time I pivoted, I think it was always towards what can I do? What can I build? How can I improve on what I'm doing? So the the what do we build essentially? So this, I think the AI happened at the right time for me personally and and this is, we are still at the very, very early stage of AI, I, I feel, uh, for us to have real use case and case studies where no one is actually questioning, is there an ROI versus how strong is your AI? Is your AI, you know, how what are you doing about all the biases in AI? And like what, you know, there are other nuances of AI. I think for us to get there, we'll say it will take some time, but uh, it's a very early stage for AI, and I'm glad to be uh, at this stage uh, for of my career in in this space. Uh, Seth, I I know yeah. enough on the brick and mortar industry that you know I can fall back on. At the same time, I <laughs> oh, know I don't I think, think you, I don't think you're going to need to at this point. I know, but I, I know what AI can do. So I it's a it's a I'm a very at a happy place to say that we've seen that, and now this will help us go to the next level. Is what I feel. And that's, I think that's just like to, to digress for a second. I think it's such an important message. You know, I have a 22 year old daughter and she's at that point figuring out like, what do I want to do career wise? And, and, and I think that when, you know, in theory, somebody like my daughter sees somebody like yourself who always knew that they wanted to build something or have something on their own and now sits in that CEO chair, um, it's extremely motivating and a, and a great message. Um, so back to, in terms of the healthcare industry, I think that you know, I speak for a lot of people that when when that concept comes to mind, we often think about um, prior authorizations as some sort of tremendous bottleneck in the industry. Can you touch on 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 how cognitive uses AI to to help with that process, if at all? Yes, sure, Seth. I think so. Um, we kind of took a back seat for the prior authorization problem. That's like the hot topic in the industry right now okay. for a for a couple of years, um, I think it's one. It's it's a very complicated. It, it has become a very complicated and very financial financially burdensome process for both providers and payers. Sure. Okay. Uh, and it's a direct Im negative impact if not done well on the patient. So it's a very hot topic because if you're not your prior authorization or not done before the patient has, you know, procedure, surgery, et cetera, there's a negative impact on financials for everybody involved. And if you're not getting that in the right time, you have to reschedule the whole procedure. You know, there's this whole many this whole lot going on in that space. So, uh, and all the, all the uh, vested bodies and uh, associations are putting pressure uh, and getting the right way to get some of the regulations changed and moved in the right direction from a from a government and the federal perspective that kind of helps with the streamlining of the process so cognitive health when we started there were already some large companies that deep pockets who were in this space okay. so we haven't really uh, done a lot in the prior authorization space to specialize ourselves in this space but sure. what we do is we do we do work on the prior authorization as a part of our workflow so if you we what we, what cognitive agents do is if we are working on any denial project, we are working on a, a um, work queue for denials uh, as a part of that process. And as a part of that, if we need to qualify or verify the prior authorizations, help the team do the prior authorization before the uh, this this procedure of surgery or appointment is set up, our our, our agents are able to go to different payer sites and check whether the prior authorization is required or not, and then go ahead and, and initiate a prior authorization. Uh, they, but there are there are there are companies out there who are focused, laser focused on this 
so very specific thing the way cognitive is looking at this is we are looking at a more broader picture and multiple use cases within the revenue cycle so you're not tied in with one solo use case sure. uh, or one solo use uh, we are able to traverse the entire life cycle from the time the patient comes in to the time the money is in the bank and you reconcile and send the report to the CFO. Cognitive agents can work through all of this continuum. Well, and I guess that's one of the benefits, you know, when, when we do talk about the topic of AI in healthcare, there's so many different areas to be able to focus on and for cognitive to really decide, okay, what's what's going to provide the most value um, to the yep. bottom line and what's going to use your strength, you know, and, I, and I'm sure that that's part of the challenge of figuring out where, where do we want to focus our efforts because there's so much right. to offer. Um, I, I had a, a personal question in that, you know, very often when people hear about entrepreneurs and CEOs, they, they read, they read online about, oh, well, this person gets up at 4 a.m. and they, they start working or, or, or this person sleeps till 11 and this person works till two or three in the morning. Um, you know, what is what does an average day look like for you? Because I would imagine that you are pulled in a million different directions, both in terms of technology, um, managing your team, um, bringing in the revenue. Uh, what What is an average? Is there an average day and what does it look like? There is no an average. That is true. And I also have read those articles, you know, before <laughs> when, 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 when this happened and when I became a CEO for Cognitive from founding founding member and CEO and then I've read all this and I worked very closely with my previous company CEOs at different stages of the company, both the startup stage as well as the growth stage as well as an IPO company. And I've seen them work and I was like, I am not like that. And I, I'm not like any of the things I read and uh, no one yeah, talks about yeah, dropping yeah. their kids to school while on the call. No one talks about right. walking a dog while they are right. doing something else. So my life is, you know, different. can I even do this? You know, it's always been the case. But I think I have my rhythm. Uh, my typical day is is, uh, is all over the day. The You know, when people talk about work-life balance, uh, the way I talk about it, it's, it's, it's just... Um, I think my mental health is more important than anything sure. else on that at course. that moment in time. Uh, I think it's, I think it's just life in general. I think I don't separate. I think it, being mm. a CEO of a startup and this is a company, I don't separate between work and non-work. I think everything is growth. Everything sure. is like positive, that. and everything is there's an output associated with it, and everything has an expectation. So am I? Are we? Are, are am I setting the right expectations for my team when I'm talking to my team? This is what we need to do. Am I setting the right expectations with my kid, with my dog? Like this yeah. is what is happening. So I have to balance all of that. So uh, it kind of spreads. Some days I have lot much work during the daytime, and then my evenings are you know my workout or whatever else. The other times it kind of flips. I have something late night. We are talking to someone else in a different time zone, so sure. it kind of switches. Point. So yeah. yeah. That's a great point. And yeah. I, I, I remember have doing an investor call them a different in a different part of the uh, time zone at 2 a.m. Uh, 2.30 a.m. Wow. Uh, uh, Eastern time, talking to an investor in a different time zone. And I was equally motivated, excited. Like, you yeah. know, it was, it was that's funny. Important. And I would have never done that. Especially on the investor side, like when we're yeah. raising money and and you yeah. know there's a there's an opportunity we we yeah. do what we need to do and yeah. you know likewise you know I'm I'm on occasion speaking to people in Singapore Malaysia and yeah. you know ideally for them it's you know 11 p.m. 11:30 p.m. Yeah. And, and we need to um, well listen I want to be I want to be cognizant of your time so um, is there any other message that you think that our audience would like to hear? And I would imagine, well, let's start with that. Is there any other any other messages that uh, that our audience might appreciate, either in terms of where the company is at um, or where you think that the company together with AI is going to be, say, six months from now? Absolutely, sir. I think one of the things I also wanted to mention, you know, as you're talking especially of prior auth uh, and things like that, I think one of the areas where we are seeing a lot of interest and traction is this entire document management and correspondence of we the, the payers are the, one of the things where I feel like money leaving on the table is a very this is a very very typical example of that there are denial letters coming in there are um, response to appeal letters coming in someone has to manually look at that letter 
route it to the right team for them to take an action, whether it's a phone call, whether it's like responding back and going to the patient's medical records and doing something more with it. Um, AI is doing all of this. Our AI agents are doing all of this and helping wow. our customers or providers to be on top of their correspondence, be on top of their response times and be on top of their posting all the cash and reconciling. So the, the CFOs have the money. There is no 30 day, 15 day, two day delay, nothing. It's like right real time uh, at any given point of time. So that's like, um, I'm very proud of our team to be able to do that. And that was one of the things we have done when, in during COVID, we couldn't really do a lot of marketing and outreach. Sure. Uh, we've honed on this product. We've spent a lot of hours and hours of retraining, training the models, et cetera. So that's uh, something which, yeah, as, and as you were saying, AI kind of traverses throughout the continuum. So your data taking in from, you know, at, at point A can be transferred to point N without without doing too much of work or anything else. So that kind of helps. So once AI has all of this data from a correspondence and the document management perspective, world is there's no limit to what you can let AI do for your denials, for your AR, for your registrations, et cetera. So that's, that's one thing which I wanted to mention. Um, okay. And uh, and and I think in general where we are, as you, I think one of the things which I didn't answer is how do we as a team keep up with what's happening? Yeah, because every every day you think this is this is the new ChatGPT and this is the new AI and this is the new and every day is the new. Um, for somebody that is at the core of it, like you are, how 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 do you keep up with it all? I think one of the things, um, just my two cents, said being in this space for a period of time, there's a lot of shiny objects out there. Right. Easy for individuals like you and I to just take a login for chat GPT and do it. But when you're trying to bring in patient data, when you're trying to bring in company corporate data, et cetera, you can't just do that. There are so many regulations, compliance. So there are there are certain bodies like NIST and we follow all of that. Uh, so every innovation, there is a financial give and take like is it worth the juice like is it how, how much will i spend if i can do a trial for like a hundred dollars or whatever but i want to scale it to a million records what would this be so there right. is always and then and once you do that if 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 i'm a company with deep pockets or i have a lot of investment money i might say oh let's go ahead and do it but then how do you transfer that as a value to our end customer at the end of the day if the provider customer whoever if it is you get you guys are too expensive for them to even afford you, then the whole innovation, I think, is a zero-sum game. I think the innovation has to be affordable for the person who is there without essentially, you know, it's not, it's not like I'm taking money from the investors and giving those freebies to the providers. Like, what's the right. balance? How right. do we how do we run how do we run um, a balanced profit and you know company which is making the margins on the product? You don't you don't necessarily make. Uh, profits from day one, but how do you make your margins right on the product? Uh, so that that's where the ROI is. So you're not spending millions on your product and charging hundreds of hundred dollars and vice versa, right? So how the, that's where I think uh, from an innovation point of view, I think I'm constantly looking at how much are we spending, where are we bringing this innovation from, so that that translates into meaningful use on the product, which the which the providers can afford to pay. Uh, that's that's my goal. And in terms of innovation, um, we have a team, we have an R&D team, research team, uh, focused specifically on working on these new new things which they hear in the market, uh, whatever is coming up. But then we, they bring it to us and then we, then we look at the real deal, like what's the value of this? How much does it cost? And what are the regulations to be tied in? So slow and steady. So there, there are so much out there, but we pick and choose what is making financial sense as well as stays within the regulations of providing a meaningful output and uh, uh, to, to our providers, provider clients right now. So that's where that's how we work on that. I got to tell you, it's all very exciting. I mean, and and I don't know how you balance everything because, you know, like you just said, that's another element of it because you're in the healthcare industry, you're, you're dealing with regulation, which is a, a big part of it. Um, well, I, I I appreciate all this insight and I, I hope you'll come back in a couple months and give us an update with uh with how things are going and where things are at. In the meantime, um, I know you have a fantastic LinkedIn presence. So anybody that's looking to get in touch with you can reach out to you there. Um, can you also uh, give us the company website? And then this way, anybody, and I encourage anybody in the healthcare space, tech space, AI, um, take a look at what's going on and try to keep up with uh, with this amazing 
uh, opportunity. What's what's the website where people can learn more from? It's uh, cognitivehealthit.com okay. is our website. And I'm doing a webinar on Wednesday for our community at the AAHAM on okay. demystifying AI for healthcare. So do listen in if that's of interest. That's a great um, topic. That's a great yes, topic. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, well, you've, yeah. you've definitely helped demystify a lot of things today. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to being in touch soon. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Seth. Be well. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.